Good morning. Good morning. I always feel very guilty about interrupting your animated conversation. <laughs> um, just the usual few announcements. Uh, first of all, the film on Florence Nightingale is showing today at 11.30. Um, some of you have corre correctly pointed out that I didn't say where these booklets are available. They're available from the Bay Bookshop in the foyer on the first floor. Um, and uh, I see some of you have already got them. Um, basically, they are the sort of basic notes for this course. Uh, if there are any profits from the sale, I share it with Shawco. So you're supporting two good causes. <laughs> um, I hope today that you all got the handout that you were waiting for and have now realized that it wasn't worth waiting for. <laughs> um, just the usual reminder about mobile phones, please. Um, and we can now go on. Yesterday we had a 90-year or an 80-year period. In theory, today we've only got about four years to cover. But of course, in order to explain those four years, we've got to go back uh, quite a long way. As I said on Tuesday, the most famous episode in the time of the Romanov rule of the Crimea had nothing really to do with the Crimea at all. And wars often start with some apparently meaningless and unrelated event. And uh, the best known example, of course, is in 1914, when the heir to the Austrian throne was assassinated in Bosnia. Two months later, the Germans and the French are pounding each other to pulp in trenches in Belgium, a thousand miles away. You might think at first, you know, it takes a whole hour to explain the relationship of that assassination to the uh, front of the, the theatre of war. And the Crimean War is another classic example of this disconnect. And the chain of events which led to war sometimes seemed to have almost nothing to do with the Crimea. It's uh, difficult to know exactly where to begin, but let's start with the central fact in the story, and that was that in the 19th century, the once mighty Ottoman Empire seemed to be in terminal decline. And there were many reasons for that, which we don't have time to go into now, but the basic reason was that the indigenous Turkish population constituted too small a proportion of the population of the empire. Now, the threat of Ottoman expansion had been, for five centuries, the dominant fear in Europe. It shaped the geography and the mental attitudes of Europe. It had been the motivation for eight crusades. And the Ottomans had penetrated so far that over a century, Vienna was in a state of partial siege. So one might imagine that the imminent collapse of the Ottoman Empire would be a cause for general jubilation. But just when it seemed the, that the Ottoman Empire might at last uh, be on its way out and that Christian Europe might get the upper hand, an equally disturbing prospect loomed on the horizon, and that was that if the Ottoman Empire disintegrated, might the main beneficiary be the already too fast expanding new Russian Empire? And nobody wanted that. And you can see on the slide here uh, the Russian expansion that took place in the reign of Catherine II. Now that's, of course, in, uh, I mean, it doesn't show the expansion all the way across to the Pacific Ocean and the other expansions, but these expansions were particularly significant because the areas that were acquired under Catherine were 
uh, much um, more developed, more densely populated, more productive than the areas in the east. Now, the situation in the Ottoman Empire offered the Russians two very tempting opportunities. One was the colossal prize of Constantinople, which was not only Europe's largest city, but a gateway to the warm water ports of the Mediterranean. The other was the presence in the Ottoman Empire of millions of fellow Slavs, mostly Orthodox Christians, who could provide the Russians with a sort of Trojan horse to breach the defenses of the empire. Now, uh, the fact that Russia, or put it this way, Russia's interest in protecting the fellow Slavs had long been a cause of concern to Western Europe. And here is a cartoon uh, published in 1790, um, showing Catherine stepping from Russia on her right foot, uh, the one on our left-hand side, one, as it says, an imperial stride takes her to Constantinople. And that's what everybody feared was the real motive behind Russian polity. And when Napoleon and Tsar Alexander I made their famous alliance in 1807, one of the bonding factors had been the possibility of French support for Russian ambitions on Constantinople. And two years later, when Napoleon bluntly told the Tsar that European public opinion would not support any Russian advance on Constantinople, it was one of the reasons why the Franco-Russian alliance cooled so quickly and led to war and Napoleon's famously disastrous invasion. However, 30 years later, and this is all very topical because the same situation has arisen hundreds of times in the 20th and now in the 21st century. 30 years later, and so now we're in the 1830s, uh, Europe was finding it increasingly embarrassing to support a brutal Muslim autocracy against Christian and European nationals. And Tsar Alexander's uh, younger brother, Nicholas, he was very much aware of Europe's phobia about Russia, and he thought he could preempt it by winning the British round to his side. So he visited England in 1844, and he talked the matter over with Lord Aberdeen, the British Foreign Secretary. And the Tsar, in the course of these conversations, described Turkey, and uh, there's always something a bit fascinating about the birth of a cliché. He described her as the sick man of Europe. And the arrangement that Nicholas thought he had made in the course of these discussions was that in the event of the Turkish Empire disintegrating, Russia and Britain would divide the spoils between them. And he even had minutes of the meeting written up, and it was signed as correct by both parties. But the crucial question about the sick man of Europe that had not been discussed in London was whether to put him on a life support machine for as long as possible, or to give him an accelerated bout of euthanasia. <laughs> and Nicholas thought, that the agreement with Aberdeen made provision for either eventuality. Now, all that might seem miles away from the Crimea, both conceptually and geographically. But now we're going to move an even likelier un uh, distance away. Since the 13th century, most of the great Christian sites in the Holy Land had been firmly under Ottoman and Turkish rule, which, of course, was the reason for launching those eight crusades. And one of these holy sites was the so-called Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem. And that, of course, was not where Christ was actually born, but supposedly built over the site of the stable. 
Some of you may have seen it. And originally, the keys to this church had been held by an order of Catholic monks, and Catholics made up, of course, the majority, almost uh, the, the whole majority, of the Crusaders. But since that time, at least 90% of the pilgrims to the Holy Lands had been Greek or Russian Orthodox Christians, as you'd expect. And 200 years earlier, in other words, in about 1600, the custody of these keys had passed into the hands of Orthodox monks. Don't sound very close to the Crimea yet. And 200 years later, now we've got to 1850, the Catholic monks were still smarting at this defeat. Europeans have long memories. And when Napoleon's nephew, Louis Napoleon, was elected president of the French Republic in 1848, the Catholics sensed an opportunity to reverse their fortunes. And they petitioned Louis Napoleon as he then was. Four years later, he becomes Emperor Napoleon III. But in 1848, he was still president. They petitioned Louis Napoleon to put pressure on the Ottoman Sultan to restore their custody of the keys. And Louis Napoleon, who was keen to win the support of the French Catholics, thought this a reasonable request, and he took it up with the Sultan, and the Sultan needed French support, and so he complied. Well, so far, so good. Or you might think, so what? the custody of the keys to a church in Bethlehem changes hands. What's this got to do with war in the Crimea? Well, when the Tsar heard of the Sultan's capitulation, he was incandescent on two counts. One was that as the self-appointed champion of legitimate monarchy in Europe, he had a violent and instinctive mistrust of any Bonaparte. He thought it was the inevitable prelude to another generation of revolutionary wars. And this became worse when Napoleon became emperor in 1852. Nicholas announced that he would not call him mon frere, as emperors are supposed to do, but instead would call him mon ami. <laughs> to which Napoleon replied that he was quite content with that because although one could not choose one's family, one could choose one's friends. <laughs> Nicholas's second reason for rage was that, as we said on Tuesday, in, 18, in 1774, a treaty had specifically granted the Russians the right of protector of the Christians in the Turkish Empire. And the Sultan's uh, reversal of the custody position went directly contrary to that. And so Nicholas immediately sent an embassy to the Sultan to get him to reverse his decision again. Now, any hope that this embassy might have had of success was totally torpedoed by Nicholas's choice of, envy, of uh, envoy, Alexander Menshikov. And Menshikov's manner was notoriously so haughty, disdainful, and domineering that it has been suggested that Nicholas appointed him because he thought these characteristics were useful in situations where negotiations had to be seen to be taking place but were required to fail. Well, Menshikov, whom a contemporary described as perfectly badly brought up, even had a possibly understandable personal grudge against the Turks, having been castrated by a Turkish cannonball in the War of 1828. <laughs> well, the Menshikov mission failed, not so much because of Menshikov's deficiencies, <laughs> but because the French and the British assured the Turks that they could count on their support against what they saw as a dangerous piece of Russian bullying. 
Now, uh, as a result, the mission failed. And Menshikov was then appointed commander-in-chief of the Russian army. And the Russians then sent troops into the, into the border provinces of Moldavia and Wallachia, uh, more or less as a bargaining chip in their dispute with the Sultan. Can you see the provinces of Moldavia and Wallachia? Just where you'd expect them to be, on the border between Russia and Turkey, and they constitute the bulk of the, current, of the present state of Romania. Um, and the French and the British now both sent fleets to the Dardanelles. And uh, you know the Dardanelles, that's the um, sort of sea, uh, sort of inland sea between the Mediterranean and Constantinople. Can you all see it? Um, they sent fleets to the Dardanelles uh, as a sort of deposit on future action. And this emboldened the Sultan to declare war on Russia in October 1853. Now, public opinion in Britain and France was being whipped up by the gutter press against the swaggering Russian bully, and the clamor became deafening when a Russian fleet destroyed a Turkish patrol at Sinope uh, on the Black Sea. The press immediately dubbed it the Massacre of Sinope, although it was just an ordinary battle like any other battle, uh, and they redoubled their demands for war. And uh, me, me, well, you can see that what's happened is exactly what Tsar Nicholas thought he had preempted, you know, when he went to see Aberdeen in 1844, nine years earlier. Meanwhile, the great powers of Europe, suddenly aware that a real war was coming uncomfortably close, put together a four-point diplomatic ultimatum. The trouble with ultimatums is that they imply that if not met, some decisive action must be taken. And when the Russians rejected one of the four points, the British and the French claimed that they had no option but to declare war on Russia, and they advanced their joint expeditionary force to Constantinople. So they're not yet even in the Black Sea. Meanwhile, the war had not gone well for the Russians in Wallachia where the sick man of Europe was showing surprisingly good health. <laughs> and faced with the prospect of increased opposition, the Russians withdrew from the Turkish provinces. So just to, so the Russians are now, have withdrawn from Moldavia and Wallachia. Um, and so by the time the allied forces reach the war zone, there's no war left to fight. However, war fever in France and Britain had now reached such a pitch that both the French and the British felt that having geared themselves up that far to fight a war, it would be embarrassing to return without having done any fighting. So they rationalized their predicament by saying that if they could cripple the Russian Black Sea Fleet from causing future alarms of this kind, that would justify their military commitment. All they really needed was just one quick military or diplomatic victory, which would be enough to save face and allow them to go home. So the British High Sea Fleet, High Command, and you can see where, are, where they are, they're on the western coast of the Black Sea, they now more or less went on a sort of Black Sea cruise looking for a good place to start a war. <laughs> and they came so close to the shore many times that they were clearly visible to local farmers and fishermen who waved a friendly hand and they waved back. Even so, a slick operation might have had the merit of taking the Russians by surprise. However, they settled on a spot um, <coughs> which offered an easy landing for troops, but was nine days' march away from the Russian naval base at Sebastopol. 
and uh, they landed um, at Calami at uh, near Eupatoria, can you see it? Uh, but they're marching to Sebastopol, which is on the southern tip of this little map here. And that gave the Russians the time and the warning to make preparations to resist a siege. So, at last, the war has come to the Crimea. Sebastopol was where the British troops decided to take up arms in support of their Turkish allies, uh, from, uh, incidentally, from whom now on they totally ignore. Um, and what we call the Crimean War was basically an allied attempt to capture the naval base at Sebastopol, met by a Russian attempt to dislodge the invaders by making peri periodic attacks on their positions. And it was all confined to a very small area of land. And at first, the Allies grossly underestimated the strength of Sebastopol. They believed, of course, that Sebastopol was a pasteboard city like all the other Potemkin villages. And they weren't properly prepared for real resistance. And when they realized what they were up against, the French and British dug themselves in near the port of Balaclava, which is just southeast of Sebastopol. And of course, the name Balaclava alone should be enough to tell you that the winter turned out to be much colder than anyone had expected. And the hero of the Russian side was a 36-year-old military engineer of Baltic German descent called Eduard Todleben, who realized immediately that although Sebastopol was well defended on the seaward side, there were virtually no defenses on the land side. And he made good that deficiency. Um, and it was really due to his efforts that the Russians were able to resist for almost a year. And uh, it's no coincidence that Sebastopol fell only after he had been wounded and sent home in June 1855. And many years later, his contribution was properly recognized when he was buried in Sebastopol, although he died, in fact, a thousand miles away. Now, ordinarily, you'd expect a country fighting on home territory to have an almost insuperable advantage. However, in the Crimea, the the reverse was almost the case. It took a minimum of 15 days to cover the 1,000 miles from Moscow to the Crimea. There was not a single railway line running south of Moscow, and the roads were hopelessly bad. On the other hand, the Allies could supply and reinforce their troops by sea, and many of the high command never left the comfort of their yachts for the whole campaign. And what has become the most famous incident in the war took place during a Russian attempt to attack the British base at Balaclava. And the attack went badly, as almost all the attacks in the war did. And the British commander ordered the light cavalry to harass a retreating Russian artillery brigade. However, the orders were misunderstood, and instead they made a full frontal charge against a totally different battery in a strong defensive position. And of the 600 members of this division, in a matter of six or seven minutes, 278 were either killed or wounded. And this is an incident that's been depicted dozens of times in different ways. And so 278 people died. Well, similar incidents happen all the time in warfare, and usually the public never get to know about them. However, the Crimean War was different in that it was possibly the first to have been covered by professional war correspondents. And the most famous of these was the correspondent for the London Times, William Russell. One British general described him as a vulgar low Irishman <laughs> who has the gift of the gab, sings a good song, 
drinks everyone's brandy, smokes as many cigars as he is offered, just the sort of chap to get information, particularly out of youngsters. Well, luckily, journalists are not like that these days. <laughs> and Russell was quite rightly so critical of the mismanagement of the war that the British commander-in-chief wanted to have him tried for treason. And Rush, uh, Russell wrote a scathing report on the disaster that befell the Light Brigade. And six weeks later, the poet laureate, Alfred Tennyson, read his report. And according to his son, Lionel, who later incidentally captained England at cricket, in a matter of minutes, wrote the poem, The Charge of the Light Brigade, on the back of an envelope. And it's become, of course, one of the best known poems in the English language. Here's Lionel Tennyson, the son of the poet laureate, in his days as England cricket captain. And here is his rather better known father, Alfred. And the um, uh, poem, of course, I'm not going to recite it all, but there's not to reason why, there's but to do and die. Into the valley of death rode the 600. When can their glory fade? Oh, the wild charge they made. All the, word, all the world wondered. Honour the charge they made. Honour the light brigade. Noble 600. Um, indeed, as the poem went on to say, someone had blundered. Now, um, I did, many of you uh, will have read uh, Cecil Woodham Smith's book, The Reason Why, which takes its name, of course, from the first line of that poem. Um, and uh, 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 that, that's a wonderful account. If you haven't read it, strongly recommend it. Another marvelous book on this is Flashman at the Charge. <laughs> Flashman is one of my favorite historical characters. Do you all know who Flashman is? He's the bully in Tom Brown's school days who's expelled eventually for getting beastly drunk. And uh, he goes into the army. And by a series of amazing flukes and coincidences, although a shameless coward and philandra, he manages to emerge as a great hero, uh, usually because he's fornicating somewhere when the battle's at its height and therefore escapes <laughs> annihilation or whatever. And uh, they're all based very, very accurately on real historical incidents. Um, and uh, I mean, they're beautifully researched. And they're terribly funny. And I think the best of all the books of the Flashman series was the one about the charge of the Light Brigade, Flashman at the Charge. Um, anyway, the only reason why the staggering British bungling did not pay the price it deserved was because all the other parties were equally incompetent. Now, the British commander, Lord Raglan, had made his name uh, or made his career, you might say, as the Duke of Wellington's right-hand man. That's not a good description, because he'd lost... <laughs> <laughs> as you can see, he'd lost his right arm. That in itself, in fact, Woodham Smith has a lovely story in her book about that, because he actually had it amputated uh, at a, on a, in a field hospital at Waterloo without anesthetic, and uh, he lay there stoically until the arm was taken away when he shouted, hey, bring that arm back, it's still got my ring on it. <laughs> <laughs> and so much of Raglan's career had been spent fighting the French that much to everyone's embarrassment, he frequently referred to the enemy in the Crimea as the French. The French, on the other hand, were led by General Saint Arnaud, who was so determined to command his armies that he came to the Crimea in the last death throes of cancer and actually died about four months later and replaced by quite an efficient general, General Canrobert. And as for the Russians, you remember they were commanded by General Menshikov. Troops often accuse their commanders of lacking certain vital personal parts. 
but it doesn't often apply literally, as in the case of the Russian commander Menshikov. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Turks were led by Omar Pasha, who took with him into battle his personal harem and a German orchestra to play, <laughs> <coughs> to play opera to the troops. <laughs> and no wonder that after the war, when a war memorial was commissioned in London, it was almost the first to glorify not the commanders, but the ordinary soldiers. And uh, I'm just going to, sorry. This is, uh, I don't know whether any of you saw the film, The Charge of the Light Brigade. Uh, it wasn't possible to put it on as a feature during the summer school because it takes too long. But I'm just going to show you a short clip of it, um, which might seem like caricature, <laughs> but it's true. It's pretty documentary, actually. Will you execute Lord Raglan's orders, my lord? I'm waiting. Captain uh, Nolan, I say if you look before you, you will see neither enemy nor guns. The usefulness of such an order eludes me. The position, I assure you, is quite clear from where Lord Raglan stands. Is it? Is it? It is! Lord Raglan's orders are that the cavalry shall attack immediately! She's one of the spectators who come to watch the battle from the heights above it. 
That's Lord Raglan. Navadi! 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 Ognia! Well, you get the idea. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's not caricature. It's a pretty documentary, as I say. Um, and the British generals really were, you know, the communication between them was as ineffective as incompetent. And in the Flashman book, Flashman plays the part of uh, Captain Nolan, you remember, who tried to warn... Um, uh, cardigan that he was going down the wrong valley when he suddenly realized where his orders had led him to. But of course in Flashman, when Flashman doesn't get killed, he gets rescued by a Turkish uh, lady and uh, <laughs> <laughs> the story uh, increases after that. Um, well, as I say, uh, the commanders were so incompetent that no wonder that after the war when a war memorial was commissioned in London, it was the first war memorial which glorified not the commanders of the armies, but the ordinary soldiers. However, as well as incompetent leadership, the war also threw up some astonishing initiatives. And the interesting thing about all these initiatives is that they were all private, unofficial initiatives. And in most cases, the army discouraged them or even opposed them and only adopted them after they had proved their worth. Now, the most famous of these is probably the improvements in medical care for soldiers, which resulted from the work of Florence Nightingale. Now, Florence R Nightingale, reformers um, are often not easy people, and Florence was no exception. And uh, she ranted against the limitations of her gender. She said that if given the choice between being a woman or a galley slave, she would choose the freedom of the galleys. And she got things done by not taking no for an answer. Uh, I mean, lots of people now say that, you know, what she did could have been done much better. I'm sure it could have been, but it hadn't been and it wasn't. Um, there was no field hospital at Scutari, which was the sort of uh, rear base for the British army. So she had the famous uh, engineer, Isambard Kingdom Brunel, build a prefab hospital in Surrey, which was then assembled on the spot in Scutari. And another wonderful free spirit, Mary Seacole, of mixed Scottish and Caribbean ancestry, came out to raise troop morale by starting something between a tavern and a hospital called the British Hotel. Some people said it had a less respectable function. <laughs> and she got no official support, and she was only rescued from destitution after the war by a subscription raised by British veterans. And in 2004, in a BBC poll, she was voted the greatest black Britain of all time. But in spite of the work of Nightingale and Seacole and other similar heiresses, four-fifths of all the deaths in the war were from disease rather than from battle. Now, bringing supplies from Balaclava to the front at Sebastopol, that's about 14 miles, was notoriously cumbersome. So a British engineer, Morton Pito, volunteered to build and fund from his own pocket a railway line. And it transformed the capability of British arms in the war. And an interesting 
sort of sidelight on the mentality of the countries fighting the war after the war, in spite of having seen how it had helped the British war effort, the Russians simply dug up the track and sold it to the Turks instead of using it or even learning from it. It gives a very interesting insight into why they lost the war. Now, William Russell reported so negatively on the soldiers' food that the head chef at the Reform Club went to the war zone, again at his own expense, to attempt to improve the cooking standards. And uh, here is the magic stove, now the portable stove, which he designed for use on the field, which remained in use pretty much as it looks there uh, until 1982. And he trained a cook in each regiment. Here is his signature recipe, <laughs> grouse salad a la Soyer. That wasn't what they produced for the Crimea, but gives you an idea of uh, his standing back at home. And his work was so highly valued that he was put on the army payroll on the salary of a brigadier general. <laughs> so if you got it right, the army accepted your innovations and adopted them. Another advance was that there was a huge interest in London and Paris for images of the wild exotic locations of the war. So a practitioner of the almost brand new art of photography went out, again at his own expense, to record the actions for the public. And here are two of the photographs taken by Roger Fenton, giving you a sort of feel for the terrain quite accurately, as the film had done too. Here's another picture of soldiers in camp. And of course, photography being, we're now talking about 1855, photography was really in its first five years. Uh, he could only take subjects which were, this, which were stationary. Uh, so, um, I mean, it's, quite, it's good, really, that this photograph doesn't give the appearance of being statuesque. Um, and he returned from the Crimea with the first war photographs, and they were exhibited at Thomas Agnew's gallery in Bond Street, London, which is still in the same business today. And as I said a moment ago, almost all the great advances of the Crimean War were the result of enterprising private initiatives. However, to return to the actual fighting, the longer the war went on, the less the gains seemed worth the costs. It was more and more difficult to justify to the public why they were fighting in the Crimea and what they hoped to achieve from it. Trench warfare led to what doctors then called trench fatigue. Later generations would know it as shell shock or post-traumatic stress disorder. And someone who made his name during the war, as I said on Tuesday, was a 28-year-old junior officer called Leo Tolstoy, who specifically requested a transfer to the Crimea to see for himself the horrors of war. And when you go to uh, the, balaclava, the site at Balaclava, there's something called the Tolstoy Battery, where you can see where he actually stood. And he wrote up his experiences in a series of wonderful pen pictures called Sketches from Sebastopol. Just to make one point, there was more to the war than that 20-mile strip of land around Sebastopol. And there was another just as vital, here's Tolstoy, as he, rather interesting to see him as a young man, because we nearly always see him as a sort of hugely bearded patriarch. Um, but there was another just as vital theater of war in eastern Turkey at a place called Kars. Um, and uh, in addition to that, the Allies tried several times to undermine Russian resistance by making naval assaults on St. Petersburg, the Kola Peninsula, that's the one on the top right, top left, sorry, of the picture, uh, and even Kamchatka in the Far East. So in other words, the, the war, in a sense, was a world war of a sort. But these were really sideshows. And the Russians always had to hold back at least half their reserves in case of attacks in the west from Austria, Prussia, or Sweden. 
And in a sense, all the Russian chickens are coming home to roost when they can least afford it. And the war aims of the participants begin to change. All that the French desperately wanted was one victory so that they could name a Parisian boulevard after it. <laughs> like the famous triumphs of the first Napoleonic Empire, the Avenue Wagram, or the Place d'Austerlitz, or the Rue de Marengo. On the other hand, British attitudes hardened when the hawkish Lord Palmerston became Prime Minister in 1855. And he did not want to end the war without permanently disabling the Russian threat to Europe. And was there anything which could bring this war to a close? Tolstoy wrote in his sketches from Sebastopol, the one central reassuring conviction you come away with is that it's quite impossible for Sebastopol to be taken by the enemy. Well, he was a better author than a military analyst. And in September 1855, after 351 days, Sebastopol fell. The French distinguished themselves by looting everything of value in the city. The British distinguished themselves by getting paralytically drunk. <laughs> 4,000 4, soldiers were court-martialed for drunkenness without any obvious effect, in spite of being docked a month's pay and sentenced to 50 lashes. The French immediately renamed the Boulevard Central in Paris, Boulevard Sebastopol, which is what it is still called today. Mission accomplished, George Bush would have said. <laughs> it was such an exciting moment that seven towns in America and Australia were immediately named after it, Sebastopol. But the military significance of the fall of Sebastopol was counterbalanced by the Russian success at Kars. So um, here you see the Boulevard Sebastopol, just to illustrate that point. Russia actually now occupied more land than she had at the start of the war. Now, in 1855, Tsar Nicholas I died. Some said of a broken heart, others said of suicide, others said of pneumonia, and he was succeeded by his son, Alexander III. Now, Alexander III was no, uh, sorry, Alexander II. Uh, Alexander was no genius. One writer said that when he talked to an intellectual, he had the appearance of someone with rheumatism standing in a draft. <laughs> but he did bring a clearer vision to the conduct of the war. And it was another six months before war weariness brought the two sides to the negotiating table. And they negotiated a peace. And basically, the peace was that the Russians had to dismantle their Black Sea fleet. But 15 years after the war, for reasons too complicated to go into now, that decision was overturned, and the Russians were allowed to rebuild their Black Sea fleet. So in addition to being a, being a war, was absolutely no justifiable causes. It was a war without any significant results. Uh, the 351 day siege had left the beautiful city of Sebastopol in ruins. Sebastopol, incidentally, means venerable city in Greek, but it's not venerable at all, and it was never Greek. When Catherine the Great founded it in 1783, she wanted to give it a name which stressed the Crimea's Greek origins rather than its previous Muslim occupants. Um, and uh, by eight, the Russians immediately began rebuilding it in 1871 on uh, as closely as possible to Catherine's original plans. And by 1890, it was once again a showcase of, British, of Russian architecture and naval power. However, some towns are just too important to be left in peace. So let's go forward to the second year of World War II. And as you know, in June 1941, Hitler broke the peace he had made in 1939, and he launched Operation Barbarossa against Russia. I presume you all know that. Now, public attention has always concentrated on the thrust towards Moscow. But Hitler claimed that taking the Crimea 
had always been a higher priority. It would be a major step towards control of the Caucasian oil fields. It would also prevent the Soviets from using the Crimea as an aircraft base against the Romanian oil fields, which were the only ones that the Germans could guarantee control of. And as a result, by September 1941, only 10 weeks after the invasion, the Germans had entered the Crimea from the land bridge to the north, that's the Isthmus of Perikop. Can you see which where I'm talking about? Um, and that's the only um, viable land bridge to the Crimea. And um, a month later, they were in occupation of the whole peninsula, except for the area around the city of Sebastopol. Now, the Nazis had military and aerial superiority on a ratio of three to one. The Russians could not afford to divert a single man from the defense of Moscow and Leningrad, and it looked as though another triumph for the Blitzkrieg was in the offing. Sure enough, Sebastopol did fall, but not until 245 days later. And the Russians mounted a heroic defense, so much so that the Germans eventually resorted to bringing in Schwerer Gustav, literally heavy Gustav, the largest railway gun ever built, built specifically to batter through the Maginot Line in France. It could fire concrete piercing shells weighing seven tons over a distance of 25 miles. Now, the ferocity of the Russian resistance was largely motivated by the knowledge that surrender to the Germans would not be governed by the normal conduct of war. The Geneva Convention never applied anywhere on the Eastern Front. With almost no access to replenishing their supplies or ammunition, the Russians resorted to fighting hand to hand. And when the city finally fell, once again, it had been totally reduced to ruins. And what was not destroyed by Schwerer Gustav and other German bombardment was destroyed by the Russians themselves to avoid leaving behind anything which could be of use to the Germans. And amazingly, all the Soviet commanders escaped from Sebastopol at the very last minute by submarine. And the Germans now put what they called Plan Trappenjacht into effect. First of all, they renamed the Crimea. They called it, can you guess? Gothenland, after the original Ostrogoths, you remember, who'd settled there in the fifth century and whom the Germans claimed were the rightful owners of the Crimea. You might think they had more urgent things to do in wartime but they immediately began excavating the Ostrogothic archaeological sites. Simferopol, the capital, was renamed Gothenburg. Sebastopol became Theodorikshafen. They rounded up almost all the Crimean Jews, and they liquidated them so efficiently that the Crimea became, after Estonia, the second Judenfrei territory under Nazi rule. I say almost all the Jews because the cranks who dictated Nazi racial policy decreed that the Karaite Jews, who did not follow the Talmud, do you remember them going back to day one? That they decreed that they were not racially Jews and therefore should be left alone. The Slav population, on the other hand, who were regarded as racially worthless, they were put into service as slave labor. And the brutality of the Germans soon gave rise to thousands of guerrilla bands, many of whom had initially supported the Germans as the lesser of two evils. However, in 1943, the tide of war turned again. And in January, the German Sixth Army, you may remember January 43, the German Sixth Army surrendered at Stalingrad. In August, the Germans lost the decisive tank battle at Kursk, in what is today Belarus. And they began to lose ground right across the Eastern Front. 
In November 1943, the Russians recaptured the land bridge across to the Crimea. By April 1944, Soviet troops had reached the suburbs of Sebastopol. The German army could have been evacuated by sea. But, as at Stalingrad, you remember, Hitler refused to allow his army commander to surrender. And his fanatic stubbornness cost the lives of 70,000 German soldiers. We don't have any ballad by great German poets to commemorate that, but this is 70,000, not 280. The German commander, Jenneke, was court-martialed and only saved from execution by the intervention of General Guderian. In May, Sebastopol fell for the second time. Once again, the victors entered a pile of rubble. The Russians' heroic defense of Sebastopol had given it a legendary status. It was awarded the title of Hero City. That probably wasn't great consolation for the 10% of his citizens who survived. But of more practical help was the decision to restore the city to its former glories. And once again, Catherine's hometown plan was the model for the reconstruction. Today, Sebastopol makes, well, when I say today, that was in 2010, it made a very good impression, the so-called white city on the hill and the port with its, or with its ornamental gateways uh, at the water's edge. There's little to indicate that it was three times the victim of one of wartime's, of wartime's most destructive sieges. And a strange little postscript, for many years, it was a closed city.